this is my sermon title today, A Mind of Service. I'm just going to be talking about serving, you know, serving one another, particularly serving the Lord. That's why we serve one another. Um, and it is going to be a, a sort of follow-on from where we left off last week when we talked about the sin of pride. And if you remember when we talked about the sin of pride, we don't want to lift ourselves up too much because, um, you know, God's going to humble us. So it's better that if we're humble, God will exalt us. Uh, Mark Tossel actually put something on his Facebook that I really liked. Um, I actually saw, I didn't know Carl Barnes saw his, <laughs> his post as well because Carl Barnes liked his post. So he must be getting Mark Tossel's Facebook posts, his public ones. But one thing, he put, I don't know whether it was something he came up with or whether he was just quoting somebody else, but the quote said, um, if, if you try and do God, if you lift yourself up, it was something like this, like if you lift yourself up and you do God's job, then he's going to do yours, which is to, to humble yourself. So your best is do your job, you know, so God will lift you up. Because if you do God's job of lifting yourself up, then he's going to do your job, which is to humble yourself. I thought that was really good. So I'm sort of continuing on that thought. You know, obviously the sin of pride, we want to humble ourselves. So today we're talking about how one way we can humble ourselves, right? And the one way we can humble ourselves is that we serve. But particularly, we want to have a mind of service. I called it a mind of service because I got the title of my sermon from Philippians 2, where we sort of ended last week. Uh, but really what I mean by a mind of service is like an attitude of service. You know, the way we think of things, this perspective we have when we go about things in our relationships, and we're going to look at some practical examples today. We want to have an attitude of service as opposed to what? As opposed to being served, right? So we can have a, we can have a self-centered attitude or we can have a serving attitude. So this, this sermon t tonight is to encourage us to have an attitude or a mind of service as we go about our walk in Christ. So we'll start off at Philippians 2, where we see the, the perfect example of having this mind of service, which was Jesus Christ. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. So we see there the mind there as well. I didn't underline that one, but the lowliness of mind. So it all starts with how we think. It all starts with our perspective. That's why putting on the new man is renewing our mind, right? lowliness of mind, having a humble mind, and then as our mind changes and our perspective changes, then our attitude and our actions are going to change. Let each esteem other. We value other better than themselves. So I've underlined other because I want you to focus on that, that when we're serving, when we're humbling ourselves, we're no longer thinking about self, we're thinking about others. The lowliness of mind is to esteem other better than yourself or themselves. Look not every man on his own things. So you see again the contrast in, in, in Philippians 2 verse 3 and verse 4. It's always, hey, we, we esteem others better than themselves. We look not every man on his own things, but on every man also on the things of others. And then it says in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So it's not just that Jesus is exhorting us to have this lowliness of mind, us to esteem other better than themselves, this mind of service, but Jesus was that ultimate example for us to follow, right? So let this mind or this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. So Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, and even though he knew that, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And what did it mean to humble himself? He took upon him the form of a servant, right? So he wasn't a king. He wasn't a ruler. No, he was a, he was a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, so Jesus Christ, as 100% man, he humbled himself, how? By taking on the form of a servant and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. So we can see here, how did he humble himself? How did he have this mind of service? Right? He had this mind of service. Uh, he had this mind that was in him, verse 5, by taking upon him the form of a servant. That's how he humbled himself. So that's where we, I get the title of my sermon, having a mind of ser service. So this is one way we can humble ourselves, is in serving one 
another. And this is really what the Bible teaches. If you look at the, 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 the parallel here between being a servant and being humble. Look in Matthew 23, 11. But he that is greatest among you... So I'm trying to choose different verses from ones I've used in the previous sermon. So this is sort of a parallel here with other ones that I've shown where Jesus says, hey, you know, if you want to be the greatest, you know, you're going to be servant of all. Right? We looked at that in Mark um, 10, I believe it was, last week. This is in Matthew 23. He says, but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And look at this. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So you see there the parallel between the greatest among you being exalted and then being a servant and humbling yourself. So that's one way we can humble ourselves is when we serve others, right? We serve God, we serve others as opposed to serving ourselves. Look at what here it says in Galatians 5. So we have Jesus Christ, the perfect example. We have humility being likened to service. And this is what we see here in Galatians 5.13. For brethren... Ye have not been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Right? So when we're being humble, we're, exalt we're exhorted to serve one another in the body of Christ and to esteem others better than ourselves. For all the law, and this is where it ties in, see humility is tied in with service, is tied in with love and charity. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, right? So it doesn't mean one word in terms of a single sentence, saying in one like word of God, right? Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Right, so you see the tie there between serving, being humble, serving, and in order to serve, it's love, right? And isn't it interesting that it ties in here, serving one another in the church, as fulfilling the law to love thy neighbor as thyself right because this is what fulfilling the law is when you when you love god with all your heart mind soul and strength when you love your neighbor as yourself right what is that is that just is that just a feeling you know is that just in your mind you're just oh man i just love them so much no no it's an action isn't it because when we love our brothers and sisters, when we love our neighbor as ourselves, what does it mean it means to serve one another so to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, what does that mean? It means to serve God. And that's one way to humble yourself under God. To humble yourself is to serve others. Matthew twenty-two thirty-five. 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And look at this, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Isn't that an amazing thought that Jesus summed up keeping all the commandments of God in two sentences, basically saying you love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. You love your neighbor as yourself. And when we compare this to Galatians 5, what does that mean? It means to serve. It means to actually do something for people, to do something for God, to do something for others. Love is not just an emotion, it's not just a feeling, it's actually doing things. And that's why when you read in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, you know, charity is all about doing things. Charity does things, right? Because it's an action, it's not just an emotion. Now, love is an emotion as well, so it's not just completely to extremes. It's not that love's not an emotion, it's only action, because you can do service without love, right? Without, so it's both but it's not just emotion. Now let's look, we already looked at Christ's example in, in, in uh, Philippians 2, but I just wanted to show you other examples from God as well, where having this mind of service is when you're doing things for other people, you're not waiting to be served, right? So having a mind of service is you're looking for ways to serve others, you're looking for a way to be a blessing, you're not first and foremost looking to be served. And this is what we need to shift in people's minds because in the world, that's what they will teach you, right? The world will teach you that the world owes you something. You know, this whole entitlement mentality. You know, a lot of people that haven't run a business or they've never been in a management position, they get this mentality that, they, that the world owes them a living, right? That's why you have jobs these days where, you know, government makes regulations where everyone gets maternity leave and paternity leave and all these different things that employers need to give you. Why? Because, you know, unfortunately we live in a democracy where it's rule of the 51% and because the majority of people are employees, right? They, they're not the ones running the business. 
that these are the sort of people that are voting, right? They're the ones that vote these things in and people get a, 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 a mentality of entitlement where it's all about, hey, people owe me a job, people owe me a living, you need to give me, me all these entitlements as opposed to, hey, what, how can you add value to your country? How can you add value to the system? So that's what we don't want to have. And especially in church, it's the same. You know, we're gonna go through some of these practical examples, but in church, it's the same when it comes to serving God. You know, do you have a mind of service where you think, hey, how can I serve God as opposed to what does God do for me? You know, well, God hasn't done anything for me lately. God's not blessing me. Well, that's not the attitude you should have. First of all, God has blessed us a lot. <laughs> you know what I mean? If, if you don't think God has blessed you, we need to take a bit of a rain check and, and think back on how God has blessed us. But with that in mind, we need to think, how do we have this mind of service where we're serving God and we are thinking about how we can serve as opposed to being served. And this is the mind of Christ, not only in Philippians 2, but even in other passages of the Bible where we see it's God that acted first. Look at here in 1 John 4. Herein is love, look at this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So you see here, it's not that we loved God first. It's not that we were so great. We were so deserving of God's love. No, God loved us first. So when we think about why do I love God so much, it's because he loved us first. Because he does so much for me. He's done so much for me already. That's why I love God. But you see here that God acted first, didn't he? He didn't just serve us because we did something for him. Right? And this is the sort of thing he wants us to do. Beloved, if God so loved us, if he loved us in this way, we ought also to love one another. So the way God loves us, we love God, why? Because he first loved us. That's the sort of love we should have for one another. Right? So if we want people to love us in a way, we ought to love them first. Right? So if you have somebody, you feel like you don't have that good a relationship with them, it's not, well, they never do anything for me. Once they do something for me, then I'm going to serve them. The attitude, the mind of service we should have is, hey, how can I be a blessing to this person? And the more of a blessing you are to other people, people will reciprocate that love naturally. Just as we, as we grow in Christ, we naturally will reciprocate that love as we walk in the Spirit and grow back to the love that we are realizing and growing in um, that God showed us. 1 John 4, 19, a few verses down, we love him because he first loved us. John 13, I wanted to go to this example at the Last Supper, what's known as the Last Supper of uh, Jesus with his disciples, where Jesus actually washes the disciples' feet. It's an amazing thing when you think about it, but we'll go through the story, and then just as, just as we read through this story, just think about what is happening here. You know, they don't know this is going to be the last time. Also, they acknowledge that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, their Lord God here, and now he's about to, you know, he takes his garments off, and he's about to, to wash their feet. Well, let's read through it, and then I'll, I'll share a few more thoughts with you as we go through. John 13. So this is ultimately one of the examples that Jesus gives us in his word, where he humbled himself to his disciples, being the Lord God of all, and served them. Jesus, look at this, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand. Now, if anybody had anything to glory about, don't you think Jesus had something to glory about, to exalt himself about, to, to think highly of himself? I mean, he, he knew that God, at this point, when he was about to do this act, right, for his disciples, he already knew he was going to be exalted above measure, that God the Father had given all things into his hands. So just keep that in mind, right? Because he's about to do this knowing that, right? knowing the greatness he was going to experience, and yet he gave us this example anyway. Knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. So it's almost, uh, you know, if you think about undressing yourself, you know, nothing sensual here. Just he's taking his clothes off because he's about to wash something, right? But I mean, people, when they, when they exalt themselves, they want to look presentable, you know, they tend to dress up, right? You tend to keep your clothes on if you want to be presentable. So not only that, he's, he's laying aside his garments, he's taking off his clothing. I don't believe he was, in, in, you know, entirely naked here. Usually when you see this rendition in movies, he's normally wearing some sort of, like, you know, shorts or something like that, um, as people would wear. Who know, I, I don't know exactly how many clothes he took off, but 
you know, that doesn't matter. So he's basically, he's laying aside his garments, he's taking off what we would see as the outward appearance to, to present, uh, how he presents himself. Um, After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now think about people, these people in these days. I mean, they're, they're walking around. I mean, their feet is obviously going to be disgusting, right? The sweat, the dirt. I mean, most people, if you were to think of their feet, even we wear shoes these days, right? But I mean, how many people would really want to wash somebody else's feet? <laughs> you know, I had this story. I, I, I was thinking about doing it to you guys, but I won't. But I'll, I'll tell you what happened in the, in the church that I was in. Um, so just so you can imagine <laughs> what happened. The guy came out, right? He, he's preaching on Sunday morning. So just before he started preaching, he has a he has a basin of water with him, right? So he just he just puts the, he puts the water over on this table that's next to him. He puts his hands in it, and now after he sort of he gave us the punchline, I know why he did all these things. So he puts his basin of water at a table, puts his hands in it, he kind of flicks his hands off, he dries his hands, and then he gets up to preach. And he preached on this passage, right? Jesus washing the disciples' feet, and he and his sermon was about humbling yourself and being you know, proud, you know, not too proud to serve one another. And then he made this statement. He says, how many of you in here have ever been to a feet washing service? And everyone's just like looking at each other, just thinking like, is this guy honestly going to make us <laughs> wash each other's feet? And he started talking about, you know, a feet washing service is a good way to get humble. And so he's saying, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass the basin around. And as I pass the basin around, you're going to wash the person next to you's feet. It's going to go around. And, you know, you can imagine the thoughts that people are having, like, you know, one thought I was having is, man, I, I, I shouldn't have sat at the very back of the room. <laughs> and the other thought I had was, oh, man, like, uh, I'm just thinking, oh, this is, you know, you start to think, oh, man, this is so embarrassing. I can't imagine that he's about to make us do this. And everyone's thinking, is this for real? You know, do I want to wash this person's feet? And, you know, you, you start sort of prepping yourself for it, all right? So, I, man, I've never heard of a feet washing service, but if that's how it is, I'm just, I'm just going to do it, right? <laughs> and humble myself. He didn't make us do it in the end. But the point he was making was, is that we have a sense of pride, don't we? And, 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 and the lesson he was trying to teach everyone is, is, is as soon as he mentioned this feet washing service, your pride kicked in and it was like, am I really willing to do this? Wash somebody else's feet. And then he's saying, well, Jesus, the Lord of glory, he was willing to wash his disciples' feet. You know, and yet... You know, it was sort of revealing to us you know, that we were not really willing to humble ourselves, even though he didn't make us go through it. But I, it's a story I've never forgotten. Like, I've never forgotten that Sunday morning when he came out with that basin of water, and it just it stuck with me ever since. So that's what Jesus did. He wiped them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter. Right? So this is the apostle. Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, what I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. He's saying to his disciples, you don't really understand what I'm doing here now, but you're going to understand later. And thank God he did this because we have this example in the Bible of Jesus Christ humbling himself and serving his disciples. Look at this. And we see here the false humility of Peter, right? False humility. People bringing themselves down but in a false way because when we go against what Jesus wants us to do, that's a false humility. Right? Well, like when people say, for example, oh, you know, but you know, I'm not a Bible reader, I don't really read, or I'm not really a friendly, you know, friend person, or I'm not really somebody that goes out and, and talks to people, you know, where we kind of like make up these, these reasons why to not obey God. But look at what Peter says here. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Now, what is Peter thinking? Like, Peter's obviously not saying that he's better than Jesus. He's, he's, he's thinking, like, how can you, being so great, wash my feet? But you see how when you're going against what God wants you to do, you're not really being humble. Even though he thinks he's being humble here, you can't be humble and disobey God. right? So here, Jesus is saying, I'm going to wash your feet. And he's like, no, you're never going to wash my feet. But then you think, hey, that's being humble because, hey, who, who is, who is he, Peter to let Jesus wash his feet? But he's actually not being humble right? because he's not submitting to what Jesus is about to do. You know, isn't that interesting? So Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. So he immediately rebukes him, saying, You know, if I don't wash your feet, then, you know, I'm not 100% sure what it means to have no part with him, but, you know, he's basically saying, Hey, how you're responding is wrong. 
So Peter has the right attitude, right? Because when he's rebuked by the Lord, he immediately repents. Simon Peter saith unto him, I don't know if you've ever read this before, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So he's like completely the opposite now. He's like, no, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus says, you'll have no part with me. And he's like, well, then wash my whole body. You know? he, Jesus saith unto him, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore he say, said he, ye are not all clean. So he's talking about Judas Iscariot. And what is he saying here? I just underline saved to wash his feet because I think there's a, there's, a, there's a lesson here that when you're saved, when you believe on Jesus Christ, even though you're saved, sometimes as you walk through the spiritual life, you walk in this world, you know, you still sin every day. And this is where, you know, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So as Jesus is saying, hey, here, you know, you're saved. I don't need to wash you whole. You know, he's just washing his feet because it's kind of like those sins that you pick up along the way. There's that lesson here too. But the, the overall lesson that is happening here is that Jesus is humbling himself, being the Lord God in heaven, manifested as a man, but yet he humbles himself and washes the disciples' feet to show this example of service. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, so now he sits back down at the table, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? So now he explains why he just washed their feet. He said, you call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. So again, Jesus recognizing to him, he already knows it, but he's recognizing to them, I am your Lord and your master, right? He knows that, but he says, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, look at this, ye ought to wash one another's feet. So the reason why God gave us that example is because oftentimes we have an attitude where we lift ourselves up and think, I'm better than that. I remember even when I went for my job, you know, like uh, my boss mentioned something to me just saying, you know, I, I had one, one responsibility in my job and, and she was saying to me, are you okay with that? And I'm saying like, yeah, that's my job, that's fine. But then she mentioned, oh, you know, because for some people that's like below them. And you know, people have this attitude at work. You know, they, won't, they won't sweep the floor. They won't change the bin. They won't just do something that's easy to do. They can earn them, you know, they can actually add some value to the business. You can help out and give yourself some brownie points. But when people have that attitude, then they have this attitude where they're too good to do that. You know, you often see that in the workplace. For those of you who work in the corporate world, you know, people that, live, that work in the corporate world, they don't want to do change bins or clean something. Why? Because it's below them. And this is what Jesus is trying to change in our mind, to have a mind of service, to humble yourself so that you don't get that attitude. So you don't have this attitude where you lift yourself up, you think you're too good to do certain things. You think you're too good to help wash up or clean up or to serve, or, you know, God forbid, you're too good to fellowship with somebody else because they don't make as much money or they, you know, they have other issues or whatever, you know, where people lift themselves up and they think they're not good enough, uh, they're, they're too good to bring themselves down to somebody's level. Jesus did this to give us the example that even though he was their Lord and Master, he was the Lord God, God the Father had given him all things, he did this to show, hey, even though he's high and lifted up, he still brought himself down low and served his disciples. For I have given you, look at this, for I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that sent greater than he that sent him. So he acknowledges that it doesn't mean just because you're serving that you're less, right? Because he's saying, hey, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that sent greater than he that sent him. So he does acknowledge that hierarchy there. If ye know these things, look at this, happy are ye if ye do them. So we understand now why he set that example, recognizing that he was the Lord God, you know, high and lifted up and yet brought himself low. And he says, if you understand this, you're going to be happy. Now that's a bit counterintuitive, isn't it? According to the world, to think that, wait a second, if I bring myself low, if I serve another person, if I do things that would, you know, I guess be disgusted by other people, how does that make me a happy person? How does that make me joyful? Well, let's look at a few practical examples and then we'll end on that thought, right? How it's going to make you happy. So let's just go through a couple of practical examples real quickly. And what I found interesting about my, these practical examples, I find that they, 
you know, when I was thinking through the different scenarios that people would think about in how we can serve one another in different relationships, church and work, I, I sort of realized, it's funny that you read these chapters so many times in Colossians 3 and Ephesians when it goes through, you know, servants, obey your masters and things like that. These are really all the ways, you know, or I don't know if it's, you know, all exhaustive, but all the ones that I could think of, I could put in the category in, in, in uh, Colossians 3 of all the practical examples that are given. So we'll go through Colossians 3 and, and have a few thoughts on these different examples. So the first one is church, and we'll start here in Colossians 3 verse 12. He says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind. Right? So again, we're talking about lowliness of mind, having a mind of service, meekness, long-suffering. Look at this, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. So you see here, as the elect of God, writing to the Colossian church, this is the example, the practical application here of serving one another and humility in the body of Christ, in the church of God here. Forbearing one another. Why do we have to put up with one another and forgive one another? Because obviously we're going to step on each other's toes sometimes. Right? We're going we're gonna to upset each other. We're going to misunderstand each other. We're going we're gonna, to uh, you know, uh, miscommunicate. So we have to forbear one another. We have to forgive one another. Look at this. If any man have a quarrel against any, look at this. Even as Christ forgave you, so we're always looking to Jesus Christ for the example, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So you see here that we, we work together, we serve one another. You see how it all lines, it all sort of intertwines, right? Humility, service, charity. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. So that's another way we can serve each other, as we teach and we correct one another in charity, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So church is one practical example that's mentioned in Colossians 3, how we um, deal with one another in this body. And like we're talking about a mind of service, as we think about in church, you ought to have that mind of service. Because a lot of people, you know, when they look for a church, maybe you've had this attitude before as well. When you go to a church, people think, you know, what, what can I, they're looking for a church to serve them. Right? They go to a church and they think, well, nobody was friendly to me. You know, nobody did anything for me. Nobody invited me over for dinner. Nobody did this for me. You know? And what I'm saying is we need to change that attitude. Right? We need to change from an attitude of being served. And as, as opposed, when you go to church, you need to think, hey, how can I serve? How can I be a blessing to other people? And if we have that sort of mindset, that's the sort of mindset that pleases God. So think about how you can serve. How can you do things to make things easier for others? You know, this is why I, I try and encourage you guys to use Team App, to use Spotio and things like that. You know, when you're when you're RSVPing for dinner, you know, and I know it sounds like a hassle, it's something to do, but the reason why I hark on it because it makes it easier for the people organizing the food. You know, now Nathan's organizing the food, and I really appreciate Nathan doing that. I'm sure Nathan understands now why it helps when people RSVP, RSVP on team and he knows how many people are coming, he knows how many people to expect, you know, and he, and he can, you know, order the right amount of food. So when you think, you know, how you can help out a church, that's one way you can help, you know, is you, is you use the systems that are there and make things easier for others. Um, even our community, we talked about this already, but our communication with others. And this really, uh, you know, goes in every area of your life, but how we communicate with others, especially in church, Right? Because you are you know, here, we have a common bond, obviously, but we don't always know each other that well. Right? So we have to figure out how we relate to one another, how we communicate with each other. And oftentimes when people, uh, you know, they have conflict right? and, they, and they don't get along with each other, you know, the mindset is always, oh yeah, but they shouldn't have said that. They should have spoken to me different. They're going to come to me, they should apologize and things like that. That is having the mind of being served right? because you're expecting the other person to do what's right, to serve you, to come to you. How does a mind of service think about that example? When, when you have a conflict, you're thinking, how can I be a blessing? How can I make things right? Uh, maybe, hey, maybe when I talk differently, I'm gonna think about how I talk differently next time so that that person doesn't react that way. And if we all had that mindset, there'll be a lot less strife. You know? And I'm not saying I'm perfect, 
you know, because I, I mess up as well. But these are the things I think of when there are conflict, when there are things that happen in church. I'm always thinking, hey, you know, I'm not really focused on what other people are doing what, or, not, or what they are or they aren't doing. I'm thinking, hey, how can I do more? How can I do things right? How can I make things easier? You know, like even when I, when I set up things and I set up systems for the church, and I'll, I'll encourage you guys to do this, but then I also think, well, how can I do it differently? How can I make it easier for people? How can I onboard them differently so it's easier for them to, to, to do this um, and do that sort of stuff? So communication with others, you know, how can I say things differently? How can, how can I react differently? You know, so it's not just, you know, how can I say things differently to, to, to not offend, but how can I change my attitude so that I'm not offended, right? So, it's, so having this mind of service is not thinking about how others change, how others do things. Having a mind of service is thinking about, hey, what can I do differently? How can I speak differently? How can I receive things differently? It's the same with making friends in church, right? You want to make friends in church, right? People will say, oh, nobody's friendly to me. Nobody comes over to me and says hello. Nobody invites me out. Nobody ever texts me. Nobody ever calls. You know, I'm not saying anyone said these things. I'm not, I'm not thinking about anyone in particular. But people comment like this. People say things like this when they visit a church. and they say, So to me, when somebody goes to a church and they have that sort of mindset, they're looking for a church that serves them rather than a church to be a part of, to serve. Let me give you another example. People will go to a church, right? And maybe the crowd is not that big. Group's not that big. And then they'll say, I didn't want to go to that church because there wasn't that many people there. And you kind of think, well, if everyone had that attitude, that no church would ever get started, right? Because every church has to start somewhere. So rather than having the mind of, hey, this church is so small, it's not really fulfilling what I want it to be. It's, it's more, hey, how I am this church. You know, like I go to church. If, if I, I, how can I help to make this church a more exciting place to be or a more friendly place to be? That sort of thing. Look at what the Bible says here in um, Proverbs 18. Oh, I, sorry, this is the last passage in Colossians 3, 7. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Proverbs 18, look at this. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. This is one verse that always has stuck with me and I always tell people when they talk about people not being friendly because I always say the Bible says a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. So if you want to have friends, you need to be friendly as opposed to just be friendly only to the people that are friendly to you. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So good friends often can be even, even more valuable to you than even your uh, blood-related brothers and sisters. All right, second practical example is family. And we continue on in Colossians 3. So Colossians 3.17, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. So we see there the family relationships now where we're applying having a mind of service. And here we see the relationship between a husband and a wife, but we also see here mentioned the relationship between a child and their parents, right? Well, particularly here, children and the fathers. Now, I'm not going to go too into depth in what it's saying here, but what I just wanted to mention here was oftentimes when passages like this are preached on, people that have the mind of being served they will listen to this passage and in, let's say I'm a husband, right? If I'm a husband and I've got the mind of being served and I listen or I read this passage, this is what a mind of being served reads it like. Ah, oh, that's what my wife should be doing. That's what my children should be doing, right? But a mind of service listens to this passage being preached, listens to this passage being read, and doesn't focus so much on verse 18 and 20. They'll be thinking, yeah, my wife should submit to me, but whoa. I should be loving my wife, not being bitter against them. If I do that, maybe my wife will submit to me easier, right? Rather than thinking, well, my wife doesn't submit. If she submits to me, then I'll love her, right? So that's a mind of being served. You want to be served first, and then you're going to serve your wife. No, no, no. A mind of service says, hey, I need to love my wife. If I love my wife, then perhaps that'll help my wife to submit to me. If I don't provoke my children to anger, that's going to make it easier for them to obey me. Do you see? So it's like a different way of thinking about it. That's what I mean. That's what I'm trying to change here in preaching this today, to give you the right mindset, the right perspective. And when you look at things, 
Are you looking at how you change, how you do things, or are you looking at what other people do for you, what other people are doing wrong? Right, so that's the family example. And it's the same when I talk to kids, right? So these commands are, uh, with marriage, commands aren't there to, to, to focus on the other party. Um, I wanted to share this story with you, uh, and I might have shared it with you guys before, just to remind you again. My dad always told me this story about why couples, uh, this story about these couple, this couple that didn't fight. And, and, and it ties into this mind of service. Because the story goes that there's this couple that doesn't fight, and then you know, neighbors and the neighbor, they always fight. So then the, the, the wives come out, you know, and they're you know, not after a fight, but they're just talking on the fence, right? And they say, ah, oh, you know, my, my husband and I are always fighting and you, I never hear you guys fighting. We're not sure why you guys never fight. She's asking for the secret of why they don't fight. So the wife of the couple that don't fight, basically the story goes, and I know I'm just butchering this story, but I just want you to get the point. The point is that the couple that fights, the reason why they fight, for example, there might be a cup left on the end of the table and somebody might spill that cup on the end of the table. And the mind of people that are uh, wanting to be served, they will immediately go, like if I'm the husband and I knock over that cup that's left on the end of the table, a mind of service is immediately going to say, why did you leave that on the end of the table? You know, I wouldn't have knocked that over if you didn't put it on the end of the table, right? And the wife will be like, well, you weren't so clumsy. You wouldn't have knocked it on the table. So you see how it's always, you do what's different. You do what's right. That's having a mind of being served. Whereas the couple that doesn't fight, they have the opposite perspective. Where when you knock the cup off the table, the husband would say, oh, I'm so clumsy. I should have not knocked on, you know. They, you know so they're thinking, how, what can I do to not make the mistake? And then the wife is saying, oh, you know, I'm so silly. I shouldn't have put the cup all the way on the end of the table. So when they have the mind of service, they're not going to fight because they're obviously thinking how, how they can do things the right way, how they can go about doing the right things for the other person as opposed to expecting the other person to do right. So who did the wrong, right? And if you have the right mindset, that's going to resolve a lot of the conflict you'll find in your family because that, that's really what conflict is. It's always the other person expecting... The, the person expecting the other person to change. It's the same with children. When I, when I try and teach my children how to play, I always, I always try and remind them, hey, when you're playing with other children, don't have the mindset of trying to get the children to do what you want to do. You know, like trying to get your brothers and sisters to play the game that you want. Instead, you know, if you try and have the mindset to help your siblings play, then you're going to have fun too. Right? And if all the children were trying to help each other play, then they'll have fun together. But when children are being selfish, right? when they have a mind of being served, every child is trying to get every other child to do what they want, and then that's when they start fighting. Right? That's what children do. Adults sometimes do the same. Right? Adults are trying to get everyone to do their will, and then this is why people fight. But if you have the mind of service, you're trying to do what's right. If we're esteeming others better than ourselves, that's going to resolve a lot of conflict because you're not trying to get what you want, you're trying to, everyone's trying to do what the other person, um, is good for the other person. Um, here's a, my second last one, so the uh, second last one is work. We see here, servants obey in all things, your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. So just quickly on work, and we sort of already talked about it already, but one way you can apply having a mind of service at work is with difficult colleagues. So just how we you know, communicate at work, oftentimes this is a value. I, I've, I've spoken to a lot of managers and, and people that I, I, that I ask what are qualities that people look for, and one quality that people look for is how you communicate and how you handle conflict at work. I'm sure when you've gone to an interview, you know, that they might ask you that question. Tell me about uh, a difficult colleague that you've had to work with, you know, and how you've had to overcome that. And what they're trying to gather from that question is how do you go about that relationship? You know, you know, are you the sort of person that looks for a way to make that relationship work? Or are you just somebody that, oh, you know, we just couldn't work it out? Because that shows you, you, you don't have that mind of service. You don't have that mind where if there's a difficult colleague that you have to work with, are you willing to change yourself to make that work? And you might have different examples where, you know, people don't, uh, you know, uh, I know one example I always think of is, you know, you know um, I, I worked with one guy that preferred things written down. 
but I prefer talking to him on the phone because I'm the sort of person that, you know, I, to, to sort of clarify something, I'd rather just pick up the phone and, and nut it through, but other people aren't like that. So I sort of think, well, in order to deal with this person, I had to spend more time writing it out nice and clear, sending it to him, because that's how he wanted it. And then I could be a bit more, uh, you know, get a bit more done, get a bit, uh, a bit more, uh, be more profitable in that, in that, in that time frame. So these are the sort of, the sort of things you want to think about, is how you can have that, uh, that mind of service, how you can do things differently. You know, when you're at work, you've got to remember that you're serving Jesus Christ. So just as you serve Jesus Christ in the church, you're looking for a way to be a blessing. If you bring this mindset into the workplace, you're going to do really well at your job. Why? Because these are the sort of things that employers look for. They look for people that are, that are proactive, that are doing a good job, that are diligent, that have initiative, that bring value to the company because ultimately as an employee, that's what you need to do. They're paying you a wage and you need to bring in more value than they're, what they're paying you. When you start bringing in less value than what they're paying you, that's when you start getting redundancies. That's when you start getting fired. Right? So if you have this mindset, rather than, oh, nobody's asked me to do anything, so I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. Right? If you have this mindset of, hey, looking for ways to improve things, looking for ways to do things better, looking for ways to add value to your company, that's a way you can be a good employee. Now, if you remember when I talked about the example of Jesus washing the feet, remember he says, if you know these things right, and you do them, happy are you? Right, so why are we happy? You know, we've just gone through different examples. Right? We've gone through you know, family, work, uh, in the church. Now, why are you happy if you do these things? Right? Jesus says here, for I've given you an example. We see in verse 17, if ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Now, why is it? Because it requires faith to see why we're doing these things. And this is what Colossians 3 ends with. This is why it's interesting that I, I sort of was thinking through this sermon and then I realized, hey, well, this is what, actually what Colossians teaches in Colossians 3. So there's these practical examples of serving, having the right mindset in how we serve and how we serve one another. And then he finishes the thought here in Colossians 3, 24. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Why? For ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Now you compare that to Ephesians 5, what you learn is even though you're humbling yourself, even though you're, you're doing in the eyes of the world is counterintuitive, you're bringing yourself low, you're serving others, you're doing the jobs that other people don't necessarily want to do, you're humbling yourself. Why can Jesus say you're happy? Because God sees those things. Like God sees the service that you do and if you realize and you remember that you're serving Jesus Christ even at your job, Right? You serve, it says here, for you serve the Lord Christ, then you know that no matter what thing you do, if you do a good thing for the Lord, you're going to be rewarded. That's why you can be happy. You can do it with joy. As opposed to people that only have a temporary mindset, the people that have a temporary mindset, they think, you know, that's not going to pay off. That's not, worth, that's not adding anything to my, to, to my value or to my life. Whereas when we do things for the Lord, it always adds value. And if we remember that, we'll always do it with the right frame of mind. And it's completely reasonable. This is the last passage I want to show you. Romans 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Look at this. Which is your reasonable, look at this, service. It's your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Look at this. By the renewing of your mind. See, we think things differently. We have a different mind. Rather than a mind of being served, a mind of service. Transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Because there will come a day, guys. There'll, there'll come a day, and it probably already has come for most of us. Right? There, come, there comes a day when you don't feel like doing things anymore. You, know, you don't feel like serving. You know, you're serving other people, but they don't reciprocate. So you stop. You don't feel like doing it anymore. So what's going to keep you doing it, keep you doing the right thing, whether it's at work, you know, when you're not being recognized, you're maybe not being rewarded how you ought, but what's going to keep you doing the right thing? 
You know, in your marriage, when your spouse doesn't reciprocate, or your children or your parents don't reciprocate, what is going to keep you doing the right thing? Right? Or at church, when you serve, and you serve God, and you go sowing, maybe you don't see the results, maybe you don't get the recognition that you deserve, or you don't have the relationships that you desire in church, what's going to keep you serving? You need to remember that you serve the Lord Christ. Like we said in, like we saw in Colossians 3, for you serve the Lord Christ. And if you remember, when you're serving the Lord Christ, you'll always receive the reward that is due to you. And not only that, it's your reasonable service. It's your reasonable service to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he died for us. He was buried. He rose again. And even though he's the Lord God of heaven, he still humbles himself. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. If that's not a God worth serving, I don't know what God will be worth serving because no other God has stepped into the creation and, 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 and died for, um, for sinners, died for his enemies. So I hope you learned something. I hope that it reminds you to, to serve, reminds you to humble yourself and also encourages you to keep on serving even when you don't feel like doing it. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the reminder. Thank you for the example that you gave us. Uh, Lord, I, I wish we could have been in that room. Um, we, could have, we could have seen you face to face and just see how you, you know, we, we only know what we read in your word, Lord, but we know that one day we're going to meet you face to face. So thank you, Lord, for revealing what you have, speaking through the Holy Ghost to your apostles and, 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 and delivering your word to us. So we thank you, Lord, that we get a glimpse into your glory, a glimpse into your life. And even the glimpse that we see, Lord, is just, um, just uh, sometimes uh, we can't describe the love that we read in your word. So we thank you and help us, Lord, that you first loved us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to love others in that same way. Remind us always, Lord, that we serve you, that we're not just serving man. So, Lord, that when we get discouraged, we can keep uh, moving forward and do it with joy. So we thank you and praise you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.